AI is not a substitute for human intelligence. It's a tool to amplify human creativity and innovation. Good afternoon. It gives me immense pride to introduce Mr. Jacob Thomas, president of Good Shepherd International School, a true believer of lifelong learning and disruption that must eventually lead to positive change and development in the community. His formal education was accomplished both in India and the USA. Thereafter, due to his strong inclination towards digital technology, he joined the IT sector, working in upcoming and set up tech companies in Bangalore before joining NetApp, a Fortune 500 data management company based out of the USA. He held a number of leadership positions with global roles and responsibilities at NetApp. Since 2020, we are proud he has taken up the role of being president to Good Shepherd International School and has been totally focused and instrumental in leading our school, launching several ambitious programs, initiatives, which include investments in cutting edge infrastructure, modernizing our pedagogy, and not to forget digital technology to develop GSIS into one of the top 10 fully residential schools in the world. As an accomplished and optimistic leader, who is fueled by his strong desire to make a positive change in the community, he has championed many projects and charitable causes, supporting schools for the underprivileged through the PC Thomas Foundation. Let us all welcome Sir as he takes us educators through the AIs in our classrooms, which will not only facilitate the redefining of our pedagogies, it will bridge the learning gaps and help us embrace disruption to bring about a positive change in our classrooms and our learners. So, over to you. Thank you all so much, thank you. Maria, thank you for that introduction. So using AI in the classroom, so before I start, um, I just wanna give a shout out to my teachers who got me here today behind this podium. Uh, some of them never would have imagined that one day I'm standing here teaching a bunch of other teachers. <laughs> so it's a proud, proud moment for me. So uh, before I get started with, the, with my presentation, uh, can I get a show of hands? How many of you in the room have not yet used ChatGPT or some form of AI? Okay, only two or three. Okay, sh should be interesting then. Thank you. So um, I'm gonna take about 10 minutes or so just to give you an overview, um, explain a few facts, uh, get, some, get some context correct in terms of what we're gonna do here. We've got, we've got two group activities, um, and I want that to be somewhat interactive. I'll give you a demo of how that's going to work for each group activity, but I want you all engaged. Does everyone have a laptop at your desk? Does somebody have a laptop at your desk? If you don't, can you see if you can swap and find yourself at a desk where someone doesn't have a laptop? Either way, we will have it up on the screen as well so you can follow along, okay? So what are the challenges that teachers face in general? Nothing to do with technology, but in general, what are the challenges that teachers face? These are some of the challenges that I came across that teachers face. Uh, classroom management, not one that tech's gonna help you with right away, but I think if you were to consult AI at some point, it, it can give you some, uh, some good suggestions on that. So I'm not gonna go through all 13, that would take us more than an hour, and that's all we have. So let me just touch on a few areas. Uh, where I think AI can be implemented to enhance productivity. And so I think that is probably the most important thing to learn about what is AI. And I've heard some people today refer to it as a tool and really that is the right definition for what AI is. Similar to this thing, how many of you have a, one of these in your hand? All of you do. How do you, what do you think of this today? What, well, how would you describe this to somebody who's nev never seen this before? How would you describe this to them? I mean, it has many definitions, right? But fundamentally, could you just say it's a tool? Could you say it's a tool? It's got a tool with lots of purposes. It's a tool, right? So the same way, AI is also a tool, right? And I think like any tool, you want to learn the best way to use it. There's lots of right and wrong ways to use tools, but what is the best way to use this tool? Now, keep in mind, this tool is only one year old, right? So it's a pretty new tool. We're all learning how to use it. 
But in, a year from, in the year that it's been around, there's lots of insights that have come out, lots of new versions of AI that have come out, sorry, ChatGPT itself that have come out, lots of new startups who have all created um, you know, some type of AI app. Um, I don't know if you know, there's a really big event happening on the other side of the world right now. Uh, it's the largest, it's called the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. It's a very large um, electronics show. And I was just catching up on some of the highlights. Almost everybody there is showing up with some kind of AI device, device, right? Forget about integrating AI, but I'm saying somebody showed up with a piece of hardware that is meant for AI. So it's rapidly changing. So what are some of the areas that, um, that AI can be used in the classroom? Really, there's lots of areas. We're going to explore a couple of them today. All the things I showed you in the pre previous slide are also areas that you can, you can utilize AI for. But I think you need a place to start, right? So that's really what we're going to focus on today. I've spoken to a lot of teachers over the last few weeks. Almost everybody is given AI a try, right? So it's not, I, I'm pretty sure, other than a handful of folks, AI isn't unfamiliar territory. So I, I hopefully we're going to learn something new as well along, as we move along. So as we talk about the few AIs, a few areas that AI can be utilized in, I think that first point is probably one of the most important, right? You have to have some framework within which you're working. So you don't just walk up to AI and ask it an open-ended question. You're not going to get a very intelligent answer. So when I mean, what I mean by framework really is you have some idea of what is the end objective you're trying to get to. And that end objective fits inside um, you know, some, some structure uh, within which you're going to fill in some gaps or gain some insights or really as a productivity tool help you accelerate filling in some of those gaps and typically I think of it as research right that's what that's my second point there it's a great tool for research um, I heard one of the speakers uh, earlier mention that you know I, I think it was uh, doc, Dr. Swati this morning who was talking about reading those books Right, so either you could spend all the time reading those hundreds of pages, or today you could take the shortcut and get AI to say, give me just the most key insights. And again, there, what question do you want AI to tell you? Do you is it key insights? Is it very, something very specific about that book that's going to fit into the research you're doing? That really is a trick. But the point is, it's a fantastic tool for research. And I'm going to give you some examples of how you can use it as a research tool as a teacher in the classroom. Here are some other examples, the, the second and third on that list. Um, the second one's a pretty obvious one in terms of refining lesson plans, identifying new resources that you might want to uh, incorporate, things that we're going to explore in, the, in one of the group activities. But the fourth one, I think, is probably one of my favorite, um, not just because I've come from a career in data management. Uh, that's really what I did for most of my life in the IT, in the IT industry but also because I'm just fundamentally a very data-driven person. Every time I'm making a decision, I find it's always helpful to have some facts and information relevant to the decision I'm making in front of me. And I think as teachers, I find it's very important for you to also to get into the habit of analyzing data. Now, what's the data you want to analyze? I would say, first and foremost, look at your scorecards, right? Look at how your kids are doing. But you could also look at other, other uh, data points along the way. And so clearly the, another big challenge that emerges from that is where is that data going to come from? So that's a much broader topic, but I think today's learning management systems, whether it's ManageBack or Toddle or what we use back in the street, we use, we use something called Veracross. There are so many platforms out there. All of them are collecting data and storing data. So AI can help you analyze that data, and a lot of that is structured data, it's unstructured data, it's data that's related to each other, sometimes it's not related to each other, but you can combine all of these intelligently and have AI do the analysis for you. And again, the same question, hey AI, I'm just giving you all this data, what insights do you see? First question, that's usually what I ask AI. And I want to see what AI first tells me, because usually I have an idea of what I want to get out of the data. But I usually like to start with that. So we're not doing that today, but that's something you should try in terms of how you analyze data. Um, and by the way, we're, most of what we're doing today is going to be based on the free version of ChatGPT. I will explain to you what the difference between the free and the paid version as well is. So that's on data analysis. The last one, which I think is also a very interesting area, again, tied to the data analysis. So let's take an example of, as an English teacher, for example, if you were to analyze the, uh, the performance of your students in English class, Right? And especially in a country like ours where English is usually a second language, it isn't your first language, how would you help a student who is struggling with their English language using ChatGPT or using an AI? That's actually one of the most interesting places where you can use it. And also it's one of the most interesting examples of personalizing AI 
for a specific purpose, right? In this case, you can actually personalize AI, even the free version. You'd have to start, and I'm gonna explain that in the next slide, what that is. But this is a great example of where you could use AI. There are also some versions of AI, not ChatGPT, but there are some versions of AI that are also conversational. So I can give it some prompts and have it have a conversation with a student who's trying to improve in their English language. Right, almost like how you would do a Viva as a teacher, right? So you can actually have AI coach the student, but actually tell AI very specifically, hey, this kid is struggling with these set of areas, help him with that. And you could create a scenario, you know, whatever type of scenario, put the child in, in some kind of a scenario, and that's what AI is going to create, whether it's, you know, um, out in a bookstore trying to find a book, right? So you could be interacting with an AI pretending to be a bookstore person who's trying to sell you a book, but you're asking the bookstore person to help you. You create a scenario as a teacher like that. So hopefully all of that made, made, made sense. Now this slide, I think, is probably the most important one in everything that I'm gonna to talk to you. AI is all about the prompts, right? So go back to what I started with, it's a tool. So how do you get this tool? How do you turn it on? How do you, how do you get it to do, do the, the specific task you're trying to do? All that is accomplished and achieved through prompts. Now notice how I've said AI prompts is context plus outcome, right? So I already established the concept of the outcome. What are you trying to accomplish? I think that's extremely important that you have some clarity and that clarity is articulated in the form of a framework of some kind. But the context is equally important. You've got to tell AI, what is the context? Now, what is the context? There are so many things, right? So, oh, sorry, I should have got a whole slide on context, but let me first tell you, give you examples of prompts. So when you're writing a prompt, and you know, the way I would explain this to you is, imagine if you were trying to explain, before AI came along, right? You have a colleague, someone working for you, and you're saying, hey, I want you to help me with this task, and you're delegating this task to somebody. How would you explain it? Right? If it's an employee of yours, you already kind of have context, right? They know who you are, you know who they are, you know what their skill set is, you know where you're coming from when you make the request, all that is already there. On well, the case of AI, it doesn't know all of that. So that's kind of what I mean by context, but so when we're talking about giving context, be clear and specific. Provide the context, I'm gonna talk about that in the next slide. Use direct language, try to be as simple as possible. Set clear objectives, uh, and we're gonna try that. We're, I'm gonna give you, give you some examples of the workshop uh, when you get, do the hands-on, what those objectives are, how you tweak them as you, as you move along. Break down complex requests, again, very important. Again, something I'll show you some examples of. You can start somewhere and keep chipping away at it. So as I was trying to imagine how I explain this, and I'm sorry, I use analogies a lot, uh, you must all be famous with the famous uh, sculpture of um, Ma Michelangelo, uh, La Pieta. So when somebody asked him, how did you create this amazing creation, what he said is, I just took away all the stone that didn't need to be there to reveal La Pieta, right? So think of AI prompts the same way. You have an idea of something, but you're gonna keep chipping away at it till you get, you, get, you refine the response to what you're actually looking for. So think of, think of it like that. You're a sculptor just chipping away with one prompt at a time. Uh, lots of other things that are pretty, pretty straightforward. Sorry, I'm rushing a little bit because I know we're out of time and I'm standing between you and lunch. So include constraints. Um, be open in it for creative tasks, right? Very, where do you want to be specific? Where do you not want to be so specific? Where you want it to actually give you ideas. There you want to be a little bit more open-ended. Sequence questions logically. That's another thing I'm going to show you examples of. How to start, how to, how to refine, how to get to, incrementally get to where you're trying to get to. Um, avoid bias to leading language. Now, I think this is an, another very important thing about AI is, I will explain it very briefly in one of my upcoming slides, but really this is a very important thing to keep in mind because especially if you're talking about ChatGPT, ChatGPT was trained on the internet. Well, I don't know how many of you have spent time in social media. I don't do a lot of social media. I'm actually terrible at it, but from what I've understood about social media, one of its drawbacks is it's incredibly biased and prejudiced. So please keep that in mind when you're talking to ChatGPT. So if you're introducing a topic or trying to explore a topic that is otherwise controversial or known to be prejudiced, keep in mind that a AI is going to reflect that to you in its responses. So when you're asking the question and if you're dealing with something like that and when you're giving those prompts, be conscious and aware of that. Review and refine uh, based on responses, of course that's pretty obvious. Now this will take some practice, I can tell you, I've been playing with this for a few months now, and every time I've used it, 
um, I've learned something new about how to interact with it. And I'll tell you, the part that I always get better at is context and outcome, both of those. That's why I put these at the top. Right? There's lots of other, lots of other uh, levers that you will play with, but context and outcome are by far the most important. So there's an example there as well. Tips for public speaking, open-ended question, right? But I want to be a little bit more specific. What are the advanced techniques for improving engagement in public speaking? Now there's a lot of, if you notice, I've used a lot of technical terms now, right? Engagement is a somewhat technical term. So now AI will, will consider your response a lot more differently because you're coming from a very specific point of view that you're asking it to go and give you an action on. So there's a lot more words, and notice it's a lot, lot longer in terms of the instruction you give, right? And that's what AI likes. The more instruction, the more, um, the more levers you provide it, it'll give you a better response. My last one, uh, like humans, and I said this at the, uh, earlier, AI thrives on feedback. Hey, did AI get it right? Let it know. And I literally talk to it like I'm talking to a human. Um, sometimes I'll say, you know what, not so much. I don't think I like that so much, and I'll tell it. And usually sometimes it'll turn back and say, well, don't move on. You didn't like it? Tell me more. What didn't you like? And it wants to know. You know why? Because it's learning. It's learning about you. It's learning about what you're trying to do, the task you're trying to perform, lots of things. So feedback is very important, by the way. Just like you would do with a human, I, al I will always tell it, that's perfect, that's excellent, that's not so great. And it knows what those things mean, and it also attaches feeling to it, which is kind of weird, but it does. Anyway, so hopefully that was, that was helpful in terms of what AI prompts are, why context is important, why outcome is important, and that is really where you should start with. Keep the outcome in mind before you venture into using this tool. So providing context. So I created a whole new slide, separate slide on this because the more I thought about it, I thought this was really important. I, I think I've covered some of these points, but here are some things to keep in mind. Who are you? AI needs to know that because who you are, as in, I actually told it a lot. So I bought the paid version of AI, of ChatGPT, and literally the first day, all I did was spending it, training it on who I am. I introduced who I am. I gave, it a, I gave it the link to our school's website to read about the school. I uploaded lots of documents and emails and speeches and things like that I've given over, over, the, uh, over the years. So it started, started to understand who is this guy. So every time I talk to it now, it refers to me as Jacob. It knows who I am. I don't no longer need to introduce myself. So in my case, because I have the paid version, I've already done a lot of the groundwork as far as context goes. So the next time I do context, I will usually be very specific. Now, if you've used ChatGPT, you'll notice you can create, you can open multiple conversations. So I purposely do that. So depending on the task or project I'm working on, I never mix the two. And so AI is also learning how I work. It knows, okay, Jacob is usually multitasking. I'm a multitasker. So I will open three different windows, three different topics. And usually the first thing I will do is I will name the topic. I will name that session. I'll give it a name, so I've already given it a high-level context. And then I would have usually in my notes written something a little longer, saying, you know, I'm trying to do this, here's where I'm coming at, here are the people involved. But another favorite thing of mine is sometimes I'll take um, meeting transcripts. I'll upload that whole document, which could be like a 45-minute conversation running into like 10 pages. And I'll give it just some context. This meeting was about this topic. We were, these are the goals of the, the, the thing here, the people who were there. Now give me the key insights, give me the action items, you know, that's how I do it. Context helps, right? So telling it who you are, what you're trying to do, where you're coming from, who the intended audience is or what that work product is makes a big difference. Be specific by using relevant terminology. Extremely important, right? Especially as teachers, I mean, terminology for you is a very, very, it's, I mean, it's a big ocean of terminology that you're using. So, what is the term that's very specific to what you're doing? AI knows what those words mean. If it doesn't, believe me, without telling you, it's already looking up Wikipedia, wherever it is, finding out what that means. It's doing that in the background. But use terminology wherever you can, like I used in the example on the previous page. The more specific you are, and the technical terminology actually makes a big difference. So please know that in some ways, you're interacting with a somewhat superior being. Of course, it's a tool in the sense that it has more ready access to information than you do as a human, right? So keep that in mind when you're interacting with it. Upload reference materials, that, like I just told you. A lot of times I will upload, for example, so one day I was working on something and I said, here is an image, I downloaded an image from the internet, and said, take a look at this image, get, get familiar with it, and we're gonna have a conversation about it. So helps, and it will usually read it, and it will immediately give you a response. Even if you just upload a uh, an image, 
it will immediately, before you even said anything, it will tell you, I got this image, I looked at it, here's what I got out of it. So helps a lot if you provide things like that. So really briefly, I just want to touch on what is an LLM and what is, what is a personalized AI. An LLM, if you haven't heard that term, is large language model. It is the methodology by which AI is trained. Now, ChatGPT is an example of probably one of the largest, just like Google Bard or Google Gemini, is a very vast LLM, right? It has, it's been trained on lots of information, and when ChatGPT, for example, is doing processing, it is considering something like 1.5 billion different sources and, and levers when it's doing its processing. So it's actually a very expensive endeavor, by the way, running, running type of any type of AI, which is why it runs in the cloud. But that's what an LLM is. Now, you can also have LLMs that are extremely specific. So um, a great example, sorry, it's one of my favorite examples, is a company that you may not have heard of, and this is actually an AI company that's been around for more than 20 years, believe it or not. Uh, but they specialize in industry. So they deal with oil and gas, with defense, with finance, uh, with finance and insurance, uh, th with retail, those are the kind of, because these are industries that are very specific terminology, very specific types of data, very specific players. So it looks at that ecosystem and it creates, and the name of the company is Palantir if you're interested in you know, checking out what they do. But they're mostly focused on enterprise. So that's an LLM. A personalized AI, I think I kind of described it earlier, it's one that is very specific to who you are or your organization. So for example, let's say tomorrow I decided I wanted to make ChatGPT available to the entire GSIS community. I could, what I would do first is tell it, hey, by the way, you're serving this community. I would provide context. You know, who is this community? What do they represent? What are the different kinds of users? What are some of the things they'll be doing? I can create a personalized version just for GSIS. So every time you ask a question, it knows it has to provide an answer within the context of who GSI is, who we interact with, who our stakeholders are, right? So that's an example of a personalized AI. How can teachers support and guide students with the use of AI tools? I think that's probably a question on all of your minds. I know it was, it's still on my mind. To be honest, there's lots of areas, and like I said in my speech yesterday, I think it's very important for us to first know how we as teachers are using it so that we can guide and instruct our students. And let me tell you something, all of our students when they're at home, they're playing with ChatGPT. They already know a lot about it, they've used it a lot, um, and I'm sure they can probably teach you a few things, so catch up. Right, so here are some examples of ways you can do it. Um, in the handout that I provide you, I've given you a few extra pages where a lot more of this is discussed in a little more detail, so please refer to that and come back with questions. This is another one, I'm sure that's on all of your minds. Um, let me cut to the chase. I know there's a lot written on that slide, but let me cut to the chase. There is no way. I hate to tell you that. There is no perfect or guaranteed sure way to know if your student used AI. Having said that, I think it's very important that your students understand one thing, though. As I covered in all the slides leading up to this moment, there are so many things to consider when you're using AI. So even as a student, they need to be aware of that. So if a student asks an open-ended question like, write my extended essay on, I don't know, the rise and fall of the Roman Empire, it's going to do it for you. But be very clear, you ask a very generic question, you're going to get a very generic answer. So if 15 students did the same thing, all of you just turned in the same paper, that's how you will find out if they used, used AI. But a smart kid, and by the way, those are the kids you want them to use AI, who knows how to use it, because he's already done most of the work, he's brought his framework, he's looking for help with research, help with some facts and figures, then AI is awesome. But otherwise, here are some tips on how you can, uh, can, um, um, can get ahead of, you know, detecting if AI is being used. My last point, and I think it is probably the most important point, um, I don't know how many of you hallucinate as human beings, turns out ChatGPT hallucinates all the time. Now, I don't know if you know this for a fact, it is a fact, the last time or the last date or event that ChatGPT was updated on, and this is the free version of ChatGPT, that's version 3.5, is January 2022. So just be aware, if you're asking the free version a question of an event or history or whatever that happened after January 2022, is it fact or fake? It's going to give you an answer, but more than likely, it made it up, right? So just be very careful about that. Unless you're going to spring for the free, the paid version, then you get lots of, lots of good information. 
So before we start on the workshop, I just wanted to plug this in there uh, and share this with you. This is a speech I gave uh, in Jaipur in August of last year at the SKU News Conference, and my topic was really to talk about AI and its impact. So if you go to my LinkedIn page or search on YouTube, you can watch that. I really talk a little bit more broadly about many of the things I've talked about here, but really the gist of it is to just to explain what do I think is going to happen uh, to education uh, based on what, what's happening today in the world because of AI. I'm sure by the time I've said it, it's going to change in, in one year's time. So with that, let's get started. Now I feel like a magician. I'm going to call my really pretty assistant to come and help me with this part of the, uh, the exercise. So follow along. Has everyone downloaded the, uh, the handout? You have it with you? Okay, good. Come on. All right, so if you don't mind, um, open your browser and Log into ChatGPT, you either, I mean, you don't have to use that URL, you can just search for ChatGPT, usually we'll get to that screen. You will be required to log in. Um, if you've got a Google account, it's the easiest way to get in, uh, or an Apple account, it's accessible, or Microsoft, or you will have to create an account. So just take a couple of minutes to do that. It will not let you use it without, without doing that. And also, even though you're using the free version, the reason it wants you to log in, it's also collecting some data. So even though you haven't, you may not have provided all that context, it is capable of doing that. It will, it will may, I, may I keep a history of some of your chats. I think the free version also has a limitation of 20, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Everyone up to the speed on this? Okay. So the first group activity, um, I'm gonna pick a very simple, task that every teacher I know performs at some point in your lives, which is creating a unit plan. All right, we'll start there. Uh, sounds simple enough uh, and not too dangerous for me who's not a teacher, so let's get started with that. So we'll take about 20 minutes for this. I know we're behind, we'll try to move along. Um, that's the handout you should have. So uh, as you read, read the instructions on page on page five, I've given you, just in case, if you wanted to see a list of all the subjects that are out there, and I just picked all the subjects that IB offers by grade. Um, so as you scroll through, you can pick, so I, I, the example I picked is from NYP5, but you can pick any grade, pick any subject, and I actually don't want you to use what I'm using, but let's start with um, that example. So we'll start, I'm just going to follow along the screen and then I'll give you a few minutes to try this and also discuss. So that's an example of a prompt, right? I'm just going to start with something very simple. Now in this case, I haven't given any more context other than just telling it to give a specific instruction, but you could also tell it who you are, right? You could give it the framework and things like that. So just for this ex exercise, we're going to try that. So there it's working on it. So take a look at the result on the screen. So. This is what ChatGPT came back with, right? So the, the topic it has picked is, let's scroll up a little bit, Sustain, sustainable development and global citizenship. So under, under integrated humanities, it has chosen that topic. Now, that may not be the topic you want, right? So you can look at this and say, that's great, but I actually want to focus on social justice. And by the way, just notice at the very bottom, you see there's a little circle with a square. That's a stop sign, right? So if you want ChatGP to stop what it's doing and you want to give it another instruction, you've got to do that, right? That's, otherwise, if you type something, you actually won't be able to do it. So it's working right now. Just scroll down. The, it's changed now. It's gone. But when you give it a prompt, you'll notice there's a circle with a square. That just basically means ChatGPT is working. And if you're going to give it another instruction, either you press stop or you wait till that's till it's done what it's doing. That's all it means. So now take a look at it. So it took, my, it took my input and it said, okay, fine, you want me to focus on social justice. It is now given another, another structure for a unit of learning based on social justice. Talking about the key concepts, the related concepts, the statement of inquiry, lots of things. Now, let's say I wanted to take this and go make it even more specific. So I'll say, that's great. Can you do this in the context of communism? 
all right? How does social justice work in communism? So now think about it. As a teacher, I'm exploring how to create a, a unit of learning. And maybe I don't have a textbook, it's MYP5, right? So I, I want to do my own research and pick an interesting topic. I could even pick something that's from contemporary type. So now I said, give me one based on communism. Here's a structure based on communism. Now, let's say I wanted to be even more specific. Do I want to talk about communism in Cuba? Do I want to talk about communism in China? Do I want to talk about communism in North Korea? Do I want to talk about communism when Karl Marx was around? You could give it those instructions as well, right? So does this help? Does, has anyone ever tried this before? OK, good. So let me give you a few minutes before we go to the next activity. I know we're running out of time, so maybe take about five minutes. Can you work amongst your table? I'll come around to see what you're working on. Give it a few tries and see how these prompts change the kind of response you get from the tool. Right, that's a, a good point. So let's say I have this lesson plan, and I want some resources that I want to include I in the resources plan. Oh, she already so did it, I so great. Did that. So, I so here asked, we go. Yeah, so I've asked them to give me some resources and books. So I actually specified that I wanted communism earlier. Just one step before that, I'd said, I like the topic of communism, but I want to explore it from the point of view of North Korea. And so give me details on North Korean, you know, uh, communism in North Korea. So then it gave me the key concepts. It used North Korean co communism, social justice, and global perspectives. And then it gave us a statement of inquiry, the inquiry questions, objectives, assessments, etc. And then I said, thank you. But now can I get resources and books that I can share with my classroom on communism in North Korea? And so then it gave me a whole lot of books, titles where I can get... Um, you know, with the authors. Um, it also gave me documentaries, reports and articles, Amnesty International, that was the name. So these resources cover a you know, range of perspectives and aspects of life in North Korea, including human rights, daily life, political system, and things like that. So, so the next activity uh, that we were going to do is about assessments. So one of the things I did when I did assessments was I told it, so I picked a book. So can you scroll back up? Yeah picked a book or a video it suggested, and I would say, write a, create a writing assignment based on this book, on this particular book. And then I would tell it, and I want the assignment the students are going to work on to be a thousand words, for example. So can we try that? Okay, um, so we'll just jump forward and try that as, as, as an example. Okay. Um, give me an example, or, or create a writing assignment based on, and pick one of the books from up there. A 1,000 word writing assignment, so you gotta oh, say sorry. that as well. Yeah. Okay. I think it was photo doc. Okay, there you go. Okay. That's a documentary. That's a documentary. No? Pick number oh, five, sorry. Dear Leader. So again, there's the, the stop sign telling you that you can't do, you can't give it any more instructions while it's working. But you can scroll down and you'll see what it's doing. Keep scrolling. So there you go. Word count, 1,000 words. No, no. I think you, there's oh, one I more. I gave it. The you told it. Yeah, hold on. Okay, I told it. I'll give that. One second. That little thing makes a difference. Nah. <laughs> How's it going? You're not, get, you're not trying it? Oh, okay, sorry. How did that work out?
It is? Okay. So we took out some quite a few systems, then we took out straight front of inquiry. So Sam from Bombay is leading the charge. Okay, <laughs> fantastic. Chennai, Chennai, okay. So uh, try also the thing about find me resources if you're creating a lesson. You have done that. Okay, good. Anything interesting come out? Um, I think I got stopped at 20, like 20 sessions, and after that it wouldn't let me do anything more. Uh, so if you use Google Bard, is it equally good? All of them, see, I think um, Bard is is just Google's version of it, right? So there will be some inherent differences. I think that's where the LLM makes a difference. How it was taught makes a difference. What it was taught, was, it was taught makes a difference. Um, in fact, I tried something else with Google, with, with ChatGPT. Um, I wanted to upload an image where I scanned a student's written assignment, but it wasn't able to do that. But Gemini claims that it can. So Gemini claims that if you provided a scanned image of a handwritten assignment, it can actually analyze it. So I actually wanted to use it for ESL, right? So I get a child to write an assignment by hand, scan it and put it into Gemini. Ge I mean, Gemini is the Google version of it. It's still being tested, but Gemini claims that it can see that image, understand the image, and then give you feedback based on what it sees there. By the way, there is actually another company that specializes only in AI-based assessments and specifically recognizing handwritings. How's Plus Point? Sorry? Plus Point. I don't remember the name. I have to look it up. Yeah. Uh, so as a career counselor, uh, if I want to provide virtual career counseling, so how do I think of setting up? And uh, do, I, do I need to know IT to set up things, or I could probably figure it but again, it depends. How do you want to use it for career guidance so counseling? Anyway, let's say I've come to this page. So let's just log in and some basic question that, okay, 10th, I take a, I take, I'm into physics, math. So what career option for it? So first stage of career counseling is address virtually. And it is free of charge to everyone. I did ask. Yeah, sorry, so I don't know if you all heard that question. So Sir was asking the question, how can ChatGPT use, be used for career guidance counseling, right? So, um, I mean, it certainly can be, but I think that's, again, a very vast topic. You'd have to boil it down to some structures and be a little bit more specific. So maybe you want to break it down and say, uh, give me this context for a particular uh, specialization. Well, let's say it's medicine, for example. So ask, how would you advise me on medicine? But I can take it a little bit more, refine it a bit more and say, uh, get specific about maybe the curriculum the student's coming from or the university or the program specifically that they're considering. So for example, you could ask it, give me ideas about universities or rank universities based on this area of specialization in this country, right? So then it could give you that. Then you could, like if I was doing it, the other question I would ask is, which one of these programs are best aligned with IB versus CBSE versus ICSE? It could give you some answers there, right? Or you could even say, if I started here, where could I go next? in my career if I were to do that in my undergrad program. So I think you could, you just have to be very specific. How do I plug it into my current system? I was just going to start to answer that question. So the question that Sir is asking is, well, that's great, but how do I get it to integrate with what I already use as a tool? So I think that is by far one of the most um, popular uses of ChatGPT today. So how many of you remember when the, the iPhone came out and the Android came out, how many apps were around back then when you went to the app store? Do you remember? Not many. Today, how many do you got? Lots of apps, right? In fact, somebody even created a phrase, there's an app for that, right? If you think of something, somebody's made an app. So that's what's happening today with, with AI and ChatGPT. What people are doing is, I mean, you just experienced what writing a prompt is like, what providing context is like. So what companies are doing now, there are many companies out there, what they're doing is they're taking the use cases that are out there. So believe me, there's plenty of people out there who have taken education as a use case and said, career guidance counselor, teacher, and more specifically, a physics teacher, or maybe you're in higher ed, and what are you doing there? There's lots of apps that are very, very industry or skill or role specific. Now, what have these guys really done? What they've done is they've done all the heavy lifting of the context of what are the right prompts to write. Now, I don't know how many of you have any experience with uh, software coding? Anyone have any experience? Anyone even dabbled in it? 
So if you've ever tried software coding, and I have very early in my life, I did that a lot. What I learned back then is all those if then and statements matter, right? Because it's all controls. You're, you're giving it you know, conditions and instructions. That's kind of how the way prompts work as well. So what these companies have done is they take what you and I would treat as a very specific prompt and create lots of these variables. So they're creating a layer above the complexity of all the variables of prompts, which by the way, can be pretty hard to write. And that, that's why today a prompt engineer is a new career and they get paid so much money because they're bringing the terminology, the context, the industry knowledge, and they've mastered how to give instructions to the AI to get the work done. And I think that's why I keep going back to this very important point. AI is a tool, right? And what is this tool fantastic at first and foremost? It is great at productivity, right? Where you would have otherwise spent a lot of time researching, documenting, putting structure, this thing does all of that heavy lifting. That's where it's really useful. And that's why I also said, if you don't have that framework, if you don't know the technical knowledge, you could be led, led down the wrong path with this and it, it could actually end up becoming the opposite. You could end up wasting a lot of time with AI. So yes, how would you integrate it? You would, you could, you could do, you, so by the way, the paid version of ChatGPT now gives you the ability to create a personalized AI, even beyond what I just described. So I could go in there and say, create a chat GPT for career guidance, and that could become your proprietary tool. As in, you designed it, you created it, you spent all the time researching and understanding how to write that complex series of prompts and all the different areas, that could be your intellectual property, chat GPT. And that's, like I said, the, the comparison I would give you is like writing an app. Right? Apple gave you the operating system, they gave you a hardware that has all the things, it's got a, a cell phone radio, it's got a Bluetooth radio, it's got a Wi-Fi radio, it's got GPS, it's got a, uh, what's the other thing that tells you about orientation? It's got all this, a gyroscope, it's got all these things built into it. You write an app that, dis that uses all of these features to perform a particular task, right? So Google Maps took all those things and said, I'm gonna create an app that gives you directions, right? Uh, somebody else took an app and said, I'm gonna, um, I'm going to use it to, I don't know, an architect could use an app, to, with the camera on the app to measure the size of this room, right? So think of, think of your AI chatbots the same way. What do you want this chatbot to do? And you want to prepackage all of these prompts with all these variables, and that's your custom chatbot. So you could create a custom chatbot just for career guidance counseling. You could be an economics teacher that says, you know what, I want to start uh, giving kids the chance to go and understand how global economies work, or how does trade in China work, uh, or how does trade in the EU work. But I could create a chatbot that has all of those conditions, all of that context, and then you as a student would just go in and start providing inputs and it would be interactive, right? So that's an example of a chatbot that you could create. So it's one o'clock on the dot. Um, so how I many people are, sorry? So here, I have a question. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, so I attended uh, one session on AI as part of IP exchange. Uh, over there, the expert was talking about how you should ask uh, ChatGPT, to, ChatGPT to assume a persona. And uh, if I'm not wrong, I believe that's what you're referring to as a context, or are they two different things? Those are two different things. So okay. in a way it is, but really what you, what you told it is, mm -hmm. so just like how the example I gave you about ESL, right? Okay. So that could be a persona, you could say, okay. I want, to, I want to have my student have a conversation. Mm -hmm. Now, I use the example of ESL, but you could say, you know what, I want to have this conversation with a Portuguese speaker. Okay. So you create the persona of a Portuguese speaker. Now, who specifically? What kind of Portuguese speaker? Is it a tradesperson? Is it a, a banker who, who's, you know? So you could put them in a scenario, and that's the persona you created. Okay. Versus context, I mean, it's kind of context, but in this one, you were, you're going a little bit more specifically and say, I want you to give every response you give me from the perspective of a Portuguese speaker, as one persona. Okay, thank you so much. No problem. Any other questions? Sorry, there's a question. Can you, she's there. Uh, have you used any generative AI like uh, to draw uh, pictures, images for our presentation, which is a good one? Actually, the most popular one is Dali, and yeah, it's actually but, built uh, into ChatGPT. Yes. With Dali, the problems that I had is it's not consistent, the drawings. Like in, in one particular, uh, you know, the characters that we create, 
it's changing the character in every uh, scenario. So, in fact, I'll tell you, image generation, I think, is probably the toughest. And I've used a few of them. You've used, I've used actually two. I've used Dali and I've used, I can't remember the other, name of the other one, something with an F. I've tried them both. Um, both are very different. Um, like, for example, in Dali, what I struggled with is, in fact, I actually was trying to create an image of what would NEP 2020 look like if it was an image. Yeah. And so I gave it a lot of prompts, I gave it lots of things, but no matter what I tried, it could not create an image that made sense to me. And I actually wanted it to identify things in the image, and that's also a place where it struggled. It struggled with combining words with pictures, it struggled with that. It's still 22, it's only a year old, yes. right? It's a one-year-old baby, let's give it some time. I'm sure give it, it'll, it'll be far superior by next year. But these things, they do exist, um, and some people have gotten better. But then, there again, I think that's where the customized chat GPTs, chatbots make a difference. Those image generators will be much, much better, hmm. right, for example? Yes. The other problem that I had is uh, sometimes the resources that it gives, uh, they're not, uh, they not the real resources. And when I prompt it more, it says, sorry, I don't have access. And, you know, like, you go ahead and do some, your own Google search. So does it happen or how to overcome Oh, that's exactly this? what I meant by hallucinations and fake versus fact, <laughs> right? So yes. even by the way, I just want to caution you, all those books you saw listed there, please don't assume they're real. Yes, yes, <laughs> right? yeah, exactly. All those books, by the way, every time ChatGPT recommends a resource to me, the first thing I do is I copy paste it into Google yes. and I do an internet search because like I told you, if you're using the free version, you're stuck in January 2022. Right, that's one big problem. And the second, again, is you know, if you ask it, that's also one of the reasons why, you know, one of my earlier slides I said, don't ask very complex questions. Provide a lot of detail in context, but make your questions a little bit more specific. Because if you ask a very complex question, now you're inviting a hallucination, <laughs> right? It will start to dream up things because of the question you asked. And by the way, very rarely does ChatGPT say, I don't know. And usually it is only because it hits the barrier of January 2022. Otherwise, 99.9% .9 of the time, it's going to give you an answer. Yeah, you just got to do a little bit more legwork yeah. to know if it's real or not. With page numbers and, you know, like the issue, journal, everything, but when you check, it's not. No, there. resources, like, for example, uh, when, I was, when I was testing this out, uh, it suggested a documentary. Uh, it was a very short documentary, and it was by the National Geographic. That's what it cited. Uh, it sounded genuine to me, but you know what I said? I just want to be sure. So I copy-pasted it, and sure enough, YouTube had the video. It's, it's, it, you know, it, the link popped up. I clicked it. I opened the video. I was like, all right, fine. This is actually a genuine resource. I can use it. It's legitimate. So please take the time to do that because, believe me, it, it is so utterly convincing that it will give you all these things. So there's a story about this lawyer who decided to take ChatGPT to court, as in use it as his assistant to do its legal brief. And he did all the work, and you know, this guy was obviously a very sharp lawyer because he said, how do I know all this stuff is real? Chachi was like, here are all the reasons why it's real. Provided even more uh, data on every reference it provided. Well, guess what? Even that was made up. <laughs> this guy just <laughs> took it at face value, and of course, he got laughed out of court, unfortunately. So don't let that happen to you. Make sure you, you fact check uh, the resources it provides. So folks, I think we're at the top of the hour. I know this went by, at least for me, it feels like it went by very fast. I don't know how it was for you guys. Uh, was this useful? Um, yeah, good. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, to be honest, we've only cut, talk, you know, I feel we have only scratched the surface. Uh, and I think as you start using it, as Swati has been, I saw her screen, she's got so many chats on there. But as you start using it, I think you will start to realize, and I think that for me, I think where I always go back to is, where can it help me save time? That's where ChatGPT helps. And again, I just want to caution you, right? You cannot make something out of nothing. It is just not physically possible. So don't go to ChatGPT with absolutely no knowledge, ask it an open question, take what it gives you and think that that's, this is enough. No, it isn't. You gotta go with, like I said, technical knowledge, terminology, take the effort to provide context and you will be much more pleased with the results it provides. Very much. <laughs> she said, just like an IB workshop, that's exactly right. <laughs> So hopefully that was useful. Everyone's hungry. Um, I don't want to delay us. We've got a busy, busy afternoon uh, right after lunch. So thank you all so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you.